Um, so my name is Carl Berlina, I'm a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, and today I want to talk about some of the work we've been doing um, in the last few years on particularly looking at speed attempts, but trying to use speed microscopy to obtain magnetic records from them. And to get started, I um, just want to acknowledge uh, some of the folks that have been involved in this project, uh, a lot of different people really helping uh, uh, with the samples and understanding how speed attempts form and so forth, so it's a, it's a very cool collaboration among um, uh, folks in this community. And so we, we've used quid microscopy to study magnetic records in some other samples. You might have heard of uh, trying to establish the early evolution of Earth's magnetic field, where we looked at the Jack Hill circumgrains that is being previous work on the Bishop Duff. Um, there's also been work on metriotic inclusions. I've done some work on chondrules. Roger has done as well. Um, we're currently looking at um, CAIs as magnetic targets and, and using squid microscopy. Um, and, and ultimately, the reason why we can do those things or we're interested in doing those things is because they're just very weak to be measured with traditional uh, paleomagnetic techniques. So we can use squid microscopy to target um, um, these particular things. What we want to address in this talk and kind of focus here is, can we use squid microscopy um, to obtain magnetic records of mineral deposits? So the idea here is that mineral deposits can provide a very high resolution record of Earth's magnetic field. And that is because the way we think about them is that they are recording, locking in magnetic records super fast. So they produce this beautiful continuous magnetic record of, of Earth's magnetic field. And particularly if you can obtain this very high resolution magnetic record or as um, high as you can go, you can better understand the mechanisms that are sustaining the geodynamo and why short term variations um, happens and things like that. So we're particularly interested, for example, with directional changes and how fast they're happening and how that's linked to processes in, in the interior of a planet. Or you can think about spikes and once again, how they're connected to the interior processes. And we don't know what we may find. So going as fine as we can can provide us with information that we might not even know yet that it's in there. And one way to look at those mineral deposits, as Pliny provided an extensive um, overview of that, is looking at speed attempts. This is a beautiful image. Um, I'm just going to hide this real quick. Oops. How do I do this? Oh, here. Boom. Sorry. All right. So this beautiful image of a, of, 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 of a cave in Israel showing um, stalagmites and, and stalactites um, that are hanging from the ceiling and also on the bottom. And um, there is a few processes that will overall affect the magnetism of speed of them. So you saw this figure before, and it's it's a very cool figure. So I think we should show it again uh, from Laskin Feinberg, two thousand Feinberg, uh, Feinberg uh, two thousand eleven. So it, it it beautifully highlights and illustrates all the processes that are present on um, on caves. So we have this particular um, um, interaction from the soil all the way to the inside of the speed of them, and how those processes are effectively uh, regulating deep into the speed of them. So if you look at the speed of them, just make sure um, um, we, we got our lesson from Pliny before. Um, uh, if you were to look at the particular speed of them, you see different layers, and those layers would, that would have different um, um, coloring, and the coloring is associated with the processes that are happening on that position. So you have first seasonal changes. So the amount of magnetic material that you have there is intrinsically, re intrinsically related to um, the environmental processes that are happening on the soil. And... Um, in the particular case, you're going to have uh, altogenic um, goethite and also uh, the magnetic particles that are coming from the drip water that's uh, mostly magnetite. But you also have those flood layers, which have tons of the tritomagnetic particles, and those are the, the sort of darker layers um, um, in, in, in speed atoms that we see. And overall, the reminiscence process is overall acquired uh, uh, through a DRM, but as we just we're talking about there's also in situ crystallization of some of those uh, 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 magnetic inclusions producing a, a CRM in, in minor scale. Okay, um, so there's been previous work that targeted um, speed of thems of mag uh, that, that targeted uh, the magnetism of speed of thems. And the reason why I italicize magnetism there is because um, speed of thems have been extensively worked, uh, used um, in other communities, for example, to look at magnetic. Um, um, uh, environmental records and climatic records. So uh, we saw the same sort of work done by Roger Fu, where we looked at uh, where they looked at the magnetic record of a speed of them and how that um, informed about the environmental processes. There's also the work done by Trindadi and others, where they looked at two different speed of thems, um, 
particularly interested in the South, South Atlantic anomaly and how um, that has evolved over time. And there's also been work uh, with Spilodems looking at the Lachamp excursion. So this was work by Alaska 2016, where they looked at the Lachamp from um, Spilodems trying to obtain magnetic records uh, from those particular samples, excuse me. <laughs> okay, um, so the two less works, particularly they are using traditional paleomagnetic techniques. And when we think about those techniques, um, they require samples uh, with volumes of several hundreds of millimeter cubed uh, in order to be detectable. And while that's what is out there and that's what we have, that's completely fine, they end up averaging hundreds of years of magnetic variation. So we by be missing some information um, of the speed of the magnetic record that we have. So the question I'm trying to address in this talk um, um, and particularly in the work that we're putting together now is can we use a squid microscopy to obtain high resolution records from speed of them? So in other words, how fine can we go in speed of them before the density of magnetic carriers in the speed of them sample is too little for us to obtain anything robust from it? Okay, so you've seen this um, speed of them before. Um, it's from the Paudalho cave uh, in Brazil. So this is uh, this is the sample that uh, we obtained from uh, uh, the group that, that led the study. And here is the inclination value showing uh, the measurements uh, before. And the idea here is to use squid microscopy on a sample that we already have magnetic studies done in, with traditional paleomagnetic techniques. So essentially comparing the results with squid microscopy to see how reliable um, our results are and how fine can we can go with our magnetic records. Okay, so we started obtaining a thick section from this particular sample that you're seeing here. Uh, the sample ranges about from the present to 600 years before the present. And what you see on the on the right there is again a, a here, it's a millimeter uh, thick section obtained from this particular part of the speed of them. So cut it in late uh, like that. And what we did here was explore uh, a couple of different sizes. And what you're seeing there are the different um, widths of the strips that we obtained from the sample. And again, all of them have one millimeter uh, of, of, of deep. Um, 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 they're, they're part of the one millimeter deep thick section. We cut those little um, uh, trapezoid shaped uh, up samples um, into um, um, squares on the surface, but one millimeter deep. And essentially each one of them will provide different averages of the time. So we're looking at about five to 10 to 15 years of magnetic variation uh, with this particular sample size that we have here. And for reference, uh, from the same study that was done before, the samples were about a thousand millimeter in cube in size. Uh, which averaged about 50 years of magnetic field variation. So one of the very first things um, that you will notice if you measure a speed of them with a squid microscope is that the maps are non-dipolar. So let me explain what that means. So here is a map from a chondro that I measured um, on the paper that we published uh, two years ago. And what we, we see is that the chondro is generally dipolar structure. You can fit a dipole and obtain a magnetic moment um, for this particular sample that we have here. And that's the general workflow of the squid microscope. You're gonna obtain a magnetic uh, field map like this one, and you're gonna use some sort of inversion technique to obtain the magnetic moment of your sample. When we look at the speed of them, um, it looks a little bit different. And granted, this is probably like a bad example that I put there, but just to highlight how they're really not dipolar. If you try to fit a dipole to that, you're not gonna get anything meaningful. And let me further highlight that with uh, an example. So. I'm gonna be recovering directions from ARMs that I've applied um, to one of our um, several um, um, speed of them samples that we have. So in the x-axis here, I'm showing the multipole model degree, and I'm gonna to get to that in just a second. And in the y-axis, I'm showing the inclination. So when we think about the multipole model degree, what I'm thinking about here is fitting a spherical harmonics um, 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 uh, distribution to the sample that you have here. And when you think about the dipole fit, you're only looking at the dipole component of the spherical harmonic expansion. When you look at the other uh, degrees on the x-axis there, you're adding higher orders uh, uh, to the to the multipole spherical harmonic expansion. So you can think about adding the quadrupole, the octopole, and so forth. And all of this is described in this paper that we're, uh, it's under review that we submitted uh, about um, a couple months ago. And what uh, we, and for reference, what I'm showing here, 
is the ARM application direction. So we apply the ARM to those samples and we expect them to acquire a magnetic field in the 90 degree direction. So we'll observe here. So each one of the black lines you're seeing there are effectively one sample that we applied in ARM. Some of those lines are multiple ARMs from the same sample, but this is just to highlight that if you were to use a simple dipole fit, like the ones we used for conjures before and then the Jack Hill zircons, you will likely get the wrong answer because your right answer will be in the negative 90. So this kind of highlights, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I, I missed the punching line. Um, but the point is that we're moving from um, those inclinations that if you're fitting a dipole will be wrong to the multipole model degree, which is, is, is doing a better job. And, and you can keep going this. And of course there is a computational power associated with going to higher um, orders here. But the, the point is that, uh, um, I missed the point again. The point is that the multipole inversion techniques are necessary to obtain the magnetic records from um, speed of 10 maps as the, the one we're seeing here. And for this particular sample that you're seeing here, we have maps like this that are about 15, uh, 15 years of magnetic field direction. So what you're seeing there again, is the ARM a uh, magnetic map for the particular sample. Okay, um, so the next steps, of course, uh, to we figure out how to obtain the magnetic moments uh, from the sample. So the next steps to actually do NRM demagnetization. So we did AF demagnetization for the samples and we overall, um, we get um, Zydervelds like this. And before I get into the details of the Zydervelds, I just wanna explain what we're seeing here. For each one of the data points that you get there, you get a squid microscope map, like the one you're seeing there, that's the ARM, the first data point. Um, we use the multipole inversion to obtain the magnetic moment. And with that, we can produce the zyder belt that you're seeing here. And we have some um, NRM demagnetizations that I would call them um, good examples. And once again, this is for a squid micro microscope. So I did my whole PhD on this and this looks great. So you might have different standards for, for demagnetization, but this is an example of, of samples that have orange training component and they look nice. We also have examples of samples that actually have terrible behavior. They don't demagnetize, they're all over the place and um, they come in, in, in different flavors. So different uh, volume sizes will produce uh, uh, demagnetizations that don't look that great. So the next step then becomes, okay, we have, um, this this beautiful demagnetization from um, some samples, this terrible demagnetization from other samples. So can we come up with some sort of parameter that allows us to identify which samples we can just throw it away or which samples we can use for obtaining uh, magnetic direction? So one way to do that is using ARM acquisitions uh, to determine the rock magnetic properties of the sample. So uh, let me elaborate on that a little bit. So for that, we have the x-axis there, the z-axis, and if we were to think you're applying a bias field in the Z direction, and that will produce a inclination um, ARM. The sample would acquire the magnetic field in that black air direction in that inclination there. And what we can do is project the acquisition direction onto the bias field direction. And we can calculate the delta ARM um, that we're seeing there. And if you think about, you can do that as many times as you want for a sample, you can apply an ARM and measure what is the ARM direction that the sample acquired. And you can compute this delta ARM parameter that essentially uh, calculates a mean uh, for this particular number of, of applications. And, and this parameter here will range from zero to two, zero meaning that all applications for that particular sample were in the correct direction and two with all of them in the opposite direction. Okay, so going back to the data that we have and the samples that we cut it and we measured that we AF demagnetized, AF demagnetized after we conducted the paleomagnetic studies, we can apply a bunch of ARMs and look at the properties of the samples. So in the x-axis here, I'm gonna be showing the distance from the top, and that is the distance from the top of the speed of them that we have. And in the y-axis here, I'm showing the delta ARM. And for your reference, or maybe not, there you go. For your reference, I'm putting the 25 degree error line. So what that means is that if all ARM applications, and for the samples that you're seeing here, uh, we apply the ARM five times, if all five applications were within 25 degrees of the direction, they would be below this line. So ideally you want to be as low as possible on the diagram. And what we can observe here between those, um, between the samples that are ranging from the one millimeter cube to the nine millimeter cube is that there is um, a magnetic properties changing across the speed of them. So is what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that 
the delta ARM is not consistent across the speed of time. Some areas would have higher delta ARM values than other regions of um, the speed of time. So let me um, walk through this a little bit more. So what we'll observe first is that the top of the speed of time has this lighter area here that has pretty high delta ARMs. But as we move down into the speed of time, we get to those darker bands, we have uh, delta ARM values that are much lower, much nicer. And there's other ways to see this too. Um, so looking at the, once again, the speed of time um, thick section that we have before, we can overlay a squid microscope map on top of the sample. And what you see here is the NRM of the thick section. And what we observe is that the, the brightest regions or the regions that have the strongest magnetic fields are what we think are the flood layers. So those regions that are darker, that have more detrital magnetic minerals there. We also observe this um, in some interesting scales. So when you look at the actual sample um, that we, we have there reflected uh, microscope images, when you plot on top of that, the BZ of the squid microscope, you can see the same sort of future, those darker regions, even in the NRM of the samples are reflecting where the magnetization um, is coming from the sample. So we overall, we see not only magnetic properties changing across the speed of them, but also within a sample that you have. And once again, further highlights that if you try to fit a dipole, it's one of those things, you're not gonna be able to get any magnetic moment uh, recover from that. Okay, so given um, that we just talked about the magnetic properties changing, can we say something about the magnetic properties of those particular regions? So in other words, is, it the, mag is the mineralogy that is changing or is the concentration of magnetic uh, material in those regions? So um, to elucidate this question, we um, did some fork work. Uh, we targeted two regions. We targeted the lighter region there and we targeted the darker region. Um, and again, just for a little refresher, the x-axis we're showing distance from the top, the y-axis we're showing the delta or m, and for that light, or for the lighter region there, the delta M is pretty high there, while um, as we move down, you see a much lower delta M value there. And what we observe is that the forks are essentially the same. We see uh, the central ridge, which is uh, very typical of non-interacting um, 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 single domain inclusions, likely magnetite. We see the same sort of uh, coercive spectrum. Uh, this particular one is a little bit stronger, right? twice. Um, at times is stronger, but overall we see the same sort of magnetic properties across the two samples. What this essentially highlights is that the concentration of magnetic minerals are playing a major role in the robustness, robustness of the magnetic record. So in other words, it's not that the mineralogy is different between those two regions, it's just that we don't have enough magnetic minerals in those particular regions for the same si si sample size that we have in those two uh, different locations. So this overall summarizes that if you're going to target a speed of them, you have to do non-uniform sampling. If you just do a uniform sampling across the speed of them, you're going to end up in regions where you have a, a, a very awesome, great uh, magnetic records, while in other regions, you're going to have terrible uh, uh, magnetic records. So by doing non-uniform sampling, you're going finer in the regions that you have plenty of magnetic carriers, while you're going a little bit more coarser in the regions that you have less. Um, and that would allow you to overall get a better uh, record from your speed of them. Okay, so that being said, let's look at the results, um, particularly comparing the results that uh, we obtained with the squid microscope uh, with the data that it was obtained between that in 2018. So once again, x-axis here, I'm showing ages, um, I'm showing age, and the y-axis, I'm showing inclination. And there's two speed of thems from the study, ILU 31 and ILU 6. The speed of them that we used in our study here that we borrowed from them is ILU 6, uh, so the blue one here. And now I'm zooming in into the particular time frame uh, that we uh, looked at um, from our uh, uh, thick section that I showed before. And I'm plotting on top here the results uh, from two particular set of volumes, so one millimeter cube and four millimeter cube. And overall, what we see is variability in matching the paleomagnetic record. And this is just a reflection of what I just presented before. The magnetic properties are changing across the speed of them. And with that, your magnetic record in some particular regions will be better, will be matching uh, that of the traditional uh, methods, why in others is going to be all over the place pretty off. So this kind of highlights how uh, non-uniform sampling is necessary. So the way to think about this is maybe 
in this particular region here where these points are definitely off, you probably want to get a sample that is as big as all those four points to kind of average all of that and get more uh, density of, of magnetic carriers in a particular region. But the other thing we can do is take advantage of the delta ARM that we calculated it early and use that as a filter for the data. So looking at the samples that had delta ARM less than 25 degrees, we see that overall they're doing a pretty decent job. So they're closer to um, the data before and they can um, um, essentially provide us with information about what samples can be used uh, 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 when we're trying to identify robust magnetic records from speed of them. So using the delta RM seems to be um, um, a good way. And I'm happy to talk more about uh, the limitations of this parameter during the Q&A session. So the other thing I want to point out here is that I just showed data for uh, the orange set and the yellow set. I did not show data for the blue set. And the reason why I did not focus on the blue volume there is because we're trying to understand uh, what is happening here. Um, particularly, so Plinio hinted that into his talk, um, as you're moving away from the central area of the speed of them, you're getting to this more sloped area here. So one thing we noticed was that even using those nine millimeter cube samples, we're getting inclination values that were very off. So what we're trying to do is now obtaining nine millimeter cube samples that are closer to this region and that require getting a thick section and also require having helium which nowadays is very hard to get. Um, so we're about to finish this and this is likely to be the last uh, study that we're uh, conducting here. And it's gonna be very important in informing um, the slope effects onto this um, smaller volumes that we're targeting here. Okay, so I wanna kind of summarize um, what one should do in terms of um, going about using a squid microscopy to target spilotems. And the way to think about this or the way I'm thinking about this is by using a triangle. In this particular triangle, there is three end members. So the first one is that there are spilotems with a variable concentration of magnetic minerals. And an example of that is what I just presented today. So is the ones that the delta M properties are changing across the spilotem for a specific volume. And you're gonna have to use definitely non-uniform sampling to um, establish any uh, robust magnetic record from there. But we also have the other end member scenario, which is spilotems with high concentration of magnetic minerals. And an example of that um, is some of the work that we've been collaborating with Eric Font on um, this, um, the try to reach spilotem from Lapa dos Morcegos um, in, in, in Portugal. And as you can see here, there's a lot of dark tone bands in this particular spilotem. And when we use squid microscope to, to target this, we get um, all the data we get is usually orange trending component. We don't see that zigzags and, and, and those are uh, one millimeter cube, two millimeter cube samples. So again, if you're looking for great magnetic records, uh, you should go for those high concentration um, uh, uh, um, speed of them. And at the same time, we also have speed of them that have low concentration of magnetic minerals. So an example of that is uh, the crevice cave. So I showed this paper uh, in the beginning, uh, particularly trying to use speed of them from the crevice cave to study the Lachamp excursion. And all of our data points, when we try to look at the one millimeter, two millimeter cubed uh, volumes, are like this. They're all over the place. We cannot get anything from it. And just to kind of uh, build a little bit more on, um, on this. So if you remember when I showed before this map showing the magnetic field um, um, uh, maps overlaying on top of the speed of them and the darker regions having a stronger magnetic field. When we look at the crevice cave um, um, thick section, we, at the same scale, we pretty much don't see anything. We don't see those uh, darker bands or we don't see strong signals associated with inside, which kind of suggests that this sample unlikely uh, uh, will work with um, squid microscopy in general, and it's just very hard. So just to kind of summarize again, there is those three and, the, and, and member scenarios, and you have to be carefully according to the problems that you're interested. And there's another layer of complexity here, which is that the speed attempts with high detrital content are hard to date. So the ones that are the ones, the ones that are ideal for paleomagnetic studies are essentially very challenging today because you're adding thorium um, uh, that is the trito and that makes uh, obtaining ages complicated. So there's a fine balance here, depending on the problem and depending on how, on how to go about it. So I guess I'm on time here. So just to summarize my talk, um, we use squid microscopy to target the mineral deposits, uh, particularly spilothems. We conducted a traded study with a previous, previously studied speed of them from the Pau Dalu cave in Brazil. 
And um, why we see that we can reproduce some of the results, um, we notice that we need to do non-uniform sampling to target the speed of them. And this is extremely problem dependent. That really depends on the sort of interesting questions you're um, interested in targeting, the times that you're looking and, and so forth. Um, and then finally, the speed of them are complex and their growth history would overall affect the magnetic record. So depending on the amount of magnetic material you're going to have in the speed of them, and it's also going to affect the dating potential. So the, the ones that are uh, a great pedomagnetic targets are terrible uh, for dating. But anyway, so the next step, um, some of the work I'm doing right now is applying some of those uh, records to uh, uh, um, speed of them that have recorded excursions. So I'm very excited about this. And look into potential uh, correlations in of, of, of those variations with environmental changes. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much for inviting me. And yeah, thank you. Thanks, Darwin. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, yeah. I have a question uh, related to the comparison with yeah. the pain magnitude to the value of a six and the results from the magnetic across the screen. Yeah. So yeah. there is quite a substantial difference oh, yeah, yeah. in the information. My first question is given Daniel's talk, yeah. where you took your samples, were they basically from the same place that the P magnitudes were taken? And does that affect the inclination? Yeah. Or is there some other processing that might be going on? Yeah, that's a great question. I think what we're seeing is the slope effects. I really I, I think it makes sense because we see that on the large samples. I would be very surprised if we're not um, seeing the same thing here. As you can see. Even the orange samples that we're targeting already are sloped. We don't have the central material there, the same um, sort of location that was used in the Trinidad 2018 paper. So my, my guess is that the fundamental difference in inclinations are probably related to the slope effects. And I'm very excited to see what we're going to see because we, we actually now have a set of samples that we're targeting the very sloped area and the area that's less sloped. I'm very excited to see how that's going to compare, you know, looking at apples with apples and, and so forth. But I think it's the slope effect, yeah. 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 I have a not dissimilar question related to the next slide, um, where you have this, this? no, sorry, oh. the comparison of the time series with that one, yeah. Um, so if I look at the 31 and 6 record, there's almost 20 degrees difference yeah. in inclination. And uh, so the question is, are you going to be able to do better than that? Because, um, you know, that would not really qualify as a high-quality high paleosexual variation. Right yeah. Now. We talked about this many hours with, with Plinio and Ricardo about the, the offset on those two particular speed attempts. And... Um, Wait, are we talking about the squid data or the, the bulk data? Well, I think we're talking about the bulk data, which is what those blue and green lines oh, yeah, are. Yeah. Right? yeah, I would love, to, okay, I, I'm not going to talk about a study that's not mine, but what I see is that, so this is actually, so the, the blue and the green are from Trinidad 2018, so that's previously done, and there is a systematic offset between the two speed attempts that we don't fully understand why, and, and it's there. Your yellow and you talk about this and this. So there's, right. there's two sources of offsets in there. Absolutely. The, the older study, and then there's your new study, which is offset relative to the old study. Yeah. So what I think what we're seeing here is what I was telling um, Maxwell before. I'm going to move this real quick. Um, oops. So yeah. the samples that we're targeting here are not exactly the same location within the speed of them as Trindadi. And I think what we're seeing here is the slope effect on our samples. And that's why there's another systematic. And is there a, potentially another slope effect? Oh, 
summer's away from home before we use these in the field. Yeah. Um, you you mentioned you think you are club layers. I'm just curious what the rationale is. What do you mean? The the darker the darker regions? I think it's just because what was that? Uh, you earlier in your talk you mentioned the, the darker layers of flood layers. I, I don't think you actually meant the flood layers of the cave or Philadelphia. No, no, that's not what I meant. Sorry. Okay. I don't think for this uh, they are not flood layers, no? Yeah, yeah, no. Did I say that? I didn't mean that, sorry. <laughs> A long day. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't mean to curb your enthusiasm, but if you go to try and measure excursion, oh, yeah, be an order of magnitude. Yes. Oh, no, my, my enthusiasm has been curbed when we started doing this project for sure. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, that, that, that is a major challenge because, um, the weaker the field, the harder it is to retrieve, no doubt. Um, so yes, um, uh, that's why. So that's why, so the, the Portuguese piece of them that I showed is very exciting because even applying weaker ARMs, we can actually still measure and obtain robust records. Um, the challenge with this particular speed of them is dating, right? So there is a, a trade-off, um, but for sure with Pau Dalia, for example, if that was the one that reported an excursion, I mean, we see that with the crevice cave, right? It's, it's impossible. So yes, it, it is complicated. Absolutely. Yep. Part of the part of the excitement about trying to use the scanning squid was that you know we get some very positive results from using half centimeters. But you know when we're comparing to geochemical devices, we're left in the And so the idea of essentially trying to scan the squid is to, to shrink that down to like a it's always hard. There's another question. Yes. Um, with the ARM, yeah. I imagine you you did the AF mean from what a hundred to zero and then the body is moving on the whole time. Um yeah, the, yeah, I think it was more than twenty six hundred and with a bias field of fifty uh micro yeah. Yeah, because I was surprised how much uh how scattered the data is. <laughs> uh, what we have before is sometimes you might have really high coercivity. Yeah. And so you have an NRM. So my question is, is did you subtract the NRM from the AF? You're talking about, um, wait, you're talking about the ARM in w which exactly point? So you buy an ARM, yeah. and you see that your ARM acquisition has been parallel to the ARP. Is that right? It, it depends on where we're talking about. Um, so I, I don't think I show there. Um, talking about your delta AR. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. So when we calculate delta AM, yeah, you have to subtract from where you're coming before, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Subtract it in our Absolutely. Whatever. But it usually, but at that point, you're done, right? Because th those things demagnetize by 50 mini Tesla. So if you if you do AF max or AF uh, 2600, you're completely removing everything. So you're subtracting noise, but you are subtracting. You, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in the Seven. Degree, uh, oh no! The, yeah. So so that's so that was just an example. Uh, the the order picking for the multipole model has a a whole al algorithm that you have to go through, and usually is more than that for this particular samples. The ARMs you can probably get away with six or seven, but if you go to more complicated structures, you're going to need higher orders. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. Oh, we're we're spending many hours debating that now. How we actually assign those uncertainties because there is the uncertainty in the component, there is the uncertainty in the inversion as well. So this is hopefully will be in the paper that we're finishing up now. But yes, we're 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 trying. So one of the things that I I, I did in the paper and I did not put here, I realized this morning after I sent you, uh, was that we went, we calculated the error from the Delta ARM. So one way to assign error bars to this. 
Um, th there is a limitation to the delta ARM because you're only looking at the ARM, you're not looking at the full demagnetization component, but that provides one way to look at it. The next step is to assign the uncertainty from the inversion. And that is also very tricky because what is the right answer? Right? In general, what is the broad range of solutions that you can get, say, on an inclination estimate? You mean, what is the error around that? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it would depend on the map. So there's a lot of different things that come into play. It's how noisy the map is. If the map is not super noisy, if you're not close to the noise limit of the squid microscope, your inversions are very consistent. And in that case, it's very easy to determine, okay, that's the answer because it's converging. But if you get noisy maps, as some of them can be sometimes, that is much harder because the, there is a, a significant variation in, in that as well. So for, for the ARMs, they are not too bad. For the ARMs, you can get pretty nice results. For the NRMs, it becomes complicated on the samples that you cannot get anything. The ones that you're seeing there with the components, they're very easy to obtain the multipolar inversion from them. Yeah, I'm happy to show details, like plots and stuff like that. Yes. Would you have a millimeter cube? Do you scan all the samples that you have no, it's just so it's just a, a BZ map that we obtain with the squid microscope. So you might include the rest of the that way. Yeah, it, it's but you're saying like one, two, three, and then use that in the first problem. Well, yeah. The example you have is the inclination varying and not reaching 90 degrees. Sure. Do you just plot the inclination and inclination? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You want to rotate the sample at least. Sure. Yeah. There is there is in, in frequencies uh, related to the inversion problem and how do you go about that. Uh, we can talk more about that offline. Um, but ideally, you like to hold your sample and do a map <laughs> all across that and, and invert, right? There is a, a, a trade off. And overall, just getting the BZ, we can obtain robust records. Um, the, the example I gave there to mortar seven was just to illustrate that the higher the mortar you go, the closer you are to the results, but you can keep going and the results will overall converge um, over time. So, uh, yeah. Can you combine the multiple equations with divisional upper containment Yeah, we, 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 we so I, I think that that's part of the, the methodology that we described on, on this paper which is um, in some samples, you can do that. Uh, we, there, I think you've discussed this before, it uh, was in Eduardo's papers. When you upper continue, there's, for maps that are like this, that are uh, noisy, when you upper continue, you end up upper continue the noise as well, which makes it harder for you to, uh, but it, it, depend, it really depends on the map. There is not one size, uh, one size fit all solution you have to, but yes, yeah, some of the, the ARMs one, are nice candidates for upper continuation and then use lower degrees of the multipole to obtain um, the magnetic moments for sure. And saves time too. This might be not repeating. Yeah, yeah. In the, when you're doing the studies on this, the size of the surface, do you see a change in the magnet? Do you think that that could be all the time? So, as long as you can get the 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 <laughs> we so when when we apply the to a first order when we apply the RMs to this we don't send the zotropy to a first order there's no you know just looking at the maps they are usually go to the right direction they don't cluster somewhere else it doesn't seem to be the case uh, but we'll see what happens when we look at those two different places with the same sizes we i haven't seen anisotropy across in this particular level but maybe when you go to bigger yeah oh no sorry yeah. you, you, yeah, yeah yeah it's your call it's your i can stay here all night <laughs>
all night. I have a hotel room for three days. Give an honest, objective view. Yeah. Uh-oh. On this scale, on the data. Yeah. Do you think that's good, my prophecy, is the best tool to use? Is there another uh, other tool that might do a better job at teaching? Oh, yeah. Okay. I love the question. Um, we use the squid microscopy not because we want, but because we need. Um, ideally, no, of course not, right? You should, if there's other things that um, um, you, you have, and for example, I mean, there's previous studies of speedotems that have um, provided records. What squid microscopy can provide is get to a level of resolution, as Josh was saying before, that is comparable to what we see in geochemistry or as a topic studies that with a 2G, we might not be able to traditionally be able to. So my answer to you is that it, the, there's a few variables, depends on the problem that you're looking at, depends on the targets that you have, and most importantly, it depends on how much time you want to spend on it. <laughs> so if you, have, uh, uh, if you have a time period that you have a speed of them, with lots of magnetic inclusions, I think it's a great idea to use a squid microscopy because you might be able to get a resolution that you wouldn't be able to get with a 2G. But for example, with the crevice cave or the Paldalu, you probably shouldn't use the squid microscope because you're not going to learn anything from it. It seems to me that some of the, the issues, the fact that the spatial resolution is large, you have too many frames and you don't have a nice So the inversion is problematic. No, it's the opposite. We don't have enough magnetic mineral in there. It's the opposite problem. But it's not the same. What would it... Something tells me that the QBM, because it's the spatial resolution, you can focus down on a smaller number of things. You can maybe have a problem with intensity, but it would need the inversion because you are just having a unidirectional magnetization that you're trying to calculate and invert into a, a vector. So, for example, I I I would I would just, um maybe maybe we're saying the same thing, but we're, but if, if I'm understanding, for example, the sort of uh, results that Roger showed earlier, if you were to measure, if you were to isolate the inclusions that he showed before I measured squid microscope, we'll probably get the same results. It's not a matter of spatial resolution. Um, in this particular case, it, it it's just a matter of. The QDM is not going to have the, the the sensitivity to measure this, probably, and you won't be able to get the magnetic results you want. We can talk offline, maybe everyone can. <laughs> but happy to I'm happy to talk more about this. But I think I think the problem is we don't have enough magnetic carriers. Not that the squid microscope is not providing us with what we need. It's just that the, it's, we're going too fine. Ultimately, we, we can talk more off, offline. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks everyone for the patience. <laughs>